Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear and see me just fine. My name is Sebastian Quist. I am the curator of invertebrates at the Royal Ontario Museum. And I'm very, very happy that you could all join us today uh, for this curator's conversation. Um, curator Conversations, of course, are a digital program that explores themes and subjects um, from ROM collections and ROM exhibits alongside industry professionals. And you'll, we have a, a true professional with us today. Um, but I'll start off by acknowledging that the ROM sits on the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabeg Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial until today. Um, so today's program coincides with uh, a new ROM exhibit called Fantastic Beasts, The Wonder of Nature. And this exhibit explores the links between magical creatures from the wizarding world and the remarkable animals in our own world. And I will say that they are equally as remarkable uh, in my mind, at least. And this of course is to encourage a greater connection to our planet and empowering us to, to be advocates for, for our planet and for nature around us. And the exhibit is on now and it ends January 3rd. So make sure you go and see that. And I think you'll you'll understand the the uh, the obvious links between the talk that we're going to have today and the and the exhibit. Um, I'm a bit giddy today. I don't often get star starstruck. Um, but today's guest is uh, a, a, a wonderful person, but a, a very, very talented uh, writer. Uh, Ed Young is uh, a staff writer for the Atlantic. Um, I can, you know, tell you about his background and go on. The list is endless, really, with honors and awards. Um, for example, he's he's won the George Polk Award for Science Reporting. Um, but I think it all culminates in a Pulitzer Prize that Ed won for, um, for his coverage on the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and in his first book, and we're going to be talking about a, a, another book uh, today, but in his first book, I Contain Multitudes, uh, that became a, a New York Times bestseller and won numerous awards. Um, his work has appeared in the New Yorker, National Geographic, Wired, the New York Times, Scientific American, and the list is endless. The list goes on. So I'm very, very happy to have Ed on today. Um, his new book, An Immense World, How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us, help us get introduced to the different senses that animals have uh, in, in, the, uh, in the animal kingdom. And it also sort of coaxes us uh, beyond the confines of our own senses and, and teases us to try to explore the world in a different way than, than using only our, our own senses or try to understand uh, different senses and different limits of, of senses for, for different animals. Um, the details of the book and where to find it are available in the chat. So welcome, Ed. Hello. Thank you so much for, for being here today. I know your schedule is really packed with the, the launch of the new book and uh, your continued coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're really, really happy that you, you took the time out of your packed schedule. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. That's great. And so I will say to everyone that if you have any questions for Ed, you can put them in the chat or for, for that matter, for myself, um, you can put them in the chat. Um, if you have any questions about COVID-19, Ed has said that he is happy to answer those questions. Um, but we are here today to, to talk about um, both the book and, uh, and the exhibit, of course, but mainly mainly the, the new book, um, An Immense World. Hey, uh, shall we start by paying tribute to your wife and coral fishes and maybe talk a bit about the inspiration yeah. to, to the book? Yeah, um, so the the genesis of the book actually began with a, a conversation with my wife, Liz Neely, who is um, a science communicator. She has her own firm called Liminal Creations, um, and she's long been interested in the sensory worlds of other animals. She started a PhD on the um, ways in which coral reef fish see colors. Um, and it was her who gave me the idea of writing a book about this topic. Um, you know, she rightly saw it as um, just a gateway to, to some truly fascinating areas of science and some really rich philosophical territory too. And that, that's why, I, that's, those are the things that I wanted to explore with the book. Um, you know, the, the senses of other animals are, I think, fascinating in their own right. Um, other creatures do so much that 
we can only, um, you know, that we can we can barely begin to imagine. Um, but the the difficulty of understanding their experiences uh, or their their ways of seeing the world is also just um, deeply rich. You know, it forces you to to flex your mind in, in new and in, uh, in new and powerful ways. Um, and I think it also recalibrates our sense of the world around us. Part of the, the promise of this book is that not only will it make you um, understand the creatures around us in, in a new way, but it will also help you see your world in a new light. You appreciate like all, all there is to know that you are currently missing because of the constra constraints of your own senses. Yeah, and I think you do that really well. Already in the introduction, you sort of invite people to look beyond their own senses or try to understand it from from a bigger point of view and and uh, i think that's that's great i mean the first thing that i felt when i when i picked up this book and i, I think other um reviewers of the book have picked up on this as well is that it is anchored in science and you can tell that from from the very long reference list towards the end <laughs> of the book but you use this language that's that's very fantastical and wondrous and and it's a it's a pleasure i mean it makes it difficult to put the book down because the language is so compelling and and I think it's a book that's um that's open to not only science you know writers or science scientists I guess but to the a general audience just because of of how you, the language that you use and I think yeah that's yeah yeah I I I want you know I've, that's been a, as a cornerstone of my work from since from, throughout my career um and it's been really gratifying hearing from people um, you know, who sent me messages saying that they are not, they have no science background at all, but have found the book joyous and deeply accessible. Uh, you know, I think that's really important because this this area, um, the the sensory worlds of other animals, what what they perceive um, and and what we might not. Um, you know, there's there's a huge amount of like technical um, uh, know how that you need to to think about it, but it, it's also an area that is deeply beautiful um you know and and a little trippy and i think the writing has to sort of live up to the promise of of the topic um you know the i can i can and do go into some length about like how how vision works or how smell works you know how how rattlesnakes sense the infrared radiation around them uh, that's given off by the body heat of their prey but you know, more than that, I, I want to then get into like the head of the snake, like try to understand like what what the experiences of these animals are. And, you know, I, I think that it's it's a topic that easily lends itself to feelings of beauty and awe and joy. Um, and I think it would be a shame if the, if the writing was didn't really try, didn't really capture that. So I tried very hard to make it um, uh, make it. Um, you know, rigorous and magical at the same time. Yeah, that's great. And that I, I think that's exactly what it is. Um, I had trouble putting it down. And I think, uh, I think people will have, will have the same feeling about it. Um, you know, one of the things that you that you separate in the book is, is senses and sensory organs, and then stimuli and sort of, the, you know, the different different parts, and they all come together to create what you call which is sort of a central topic through the book and which we might touch upon briefly uh what you call umwelt right which is this german yeah. word so can you explain that for us a bit more yeah the, the word literally means environment but the um scientist who popularized it jakob von Uxko, um didn't use it to just mean an animal's physical environment he's re he was referring to the part of that environment that the animal can sense it, its perceptual bubble Every creature he recognized has its own set of sights and smells and sounds and textures and, and so on that it can it can perceive, but that other creatures might not be able to. Um, the uh, analogy he gave was, you know, imagine um, an animal, uh, an animal's brain is the um, inhabitant of a house and the animal's body is the house. The brain is the person standing inside the house. Uh, the house has lots of windows, each corresponding to a different sense, a, a sight window, a smell window, a, a touch window. And all of that is overlooking a garden. Now, from the point of view of the house's inhabitant, you can see part, a partial view of the garden from a specific angle, but you're not going to get the fullness of it. And that's exactly what each of us has when we, when we um, 
uh, sense of the world, a, a restricted view. You know, a, a tick, for example, can smell, can detect the um, the body heat of a human, or the the touch of hair on on the skin of a host, or the smell coming from that host's skin. But it does doesn't see like light and color in the same way that we do. It doesn't hear the sounds that we can hear. Likewise, we aren't privy to like the electric fields that a shark can detect or the magnetic field of Earth that a turtle can detect or the, the infrared radiation that a rattlesnake can sense. Like every creature has its own thin sliver of the fullness of reality that it is privy to. Um, and, and I think that's a very humbling idea. The, the senses give us this view, of this experience of the world that feels complete. You know, I'm not sitting here feeling like the gaps in my hearing or my, my vision that, um, uh, that, you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking about what I'm missing. It feels like my experience of the world is, is full um, and total. But of course, it, it isn't. That is an illusion. And it's an illusion that all animals share. So the, the argument of the book really is that to, to get into the umbelt of other animals and to step outside the human umbelt um, is necessary to really appreciate the fullness of reality, to understand how much is going on in the world that we are missing because um, of the, the, the ways our senses enclose and constrain us. Yeah, and I think one of the things that hit me immediately was that it is very humbling to think of other animal species as um, with higher sensory organs or or that can perceive their, their world in a very different way. And some would say a, a better way. Um, but what is humbling, I think, is that I started thinking about the ways that the umwelt is different, even for individuals, say humans, for example. My umwelt uh, will be very different from someone uh, who is colorblind, for example, or, or that doesn't have as many rods and cones, or that, that lacks a sense of smell that I might have, or the opposite way around. So, you know, it's, it's very humbling to, to think about that at an individual level as well. And I think it um, possibly creates... Um, um, an understanding of the world around you in a better way, and maybe an appreciation for people that that have a you know have different senses and animals that have different senses than yourself. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, the, um, the, there's so much variation even within our own species. You know, yeah. I, uh, one of my close friends is anosmic and and has always been. Um, she she really has no sense of smell at all. Um, you know, there, there are people, as you say, who are colorblind. There are others who have vision that are, that's a bit closer to birds, where they have that, a whole dimension of colors that they can see and most other people cannot. Um, yeah. In the book, I talk about humans um, who can echolocate, um, you know, who have a sort of, who can wield a kind of biological sonar in the way that bats or, or dolphins can, but less refined, sure, but it, it's still there. So yes, um, the, the book is, at least partly also about the diversity of human umwelt and um and you know I, I say quite early on that um that this is a book about diversity not about superiority yeah. there's a very common way in which people engage with the senses of other animals which is to only um think of them as worthy of knowledge if they surpass our own you know people are, are awed by like sharks smelling drops of blood in the ocean or you know that that sort of thing but um but I think um, this book is also about the ways, just about the ways in which the senses differ um, yeah. and why they differ. And, and, you know, the interesting ways in which the, the interesting things that those differences tell us about. In just one very small example, um, there are uh, there are species of monkey in South America um, where some individuals um, have close to average human color vision and some individuals have color vision that's close to a colorblind person or so what my dog sees you know they see about one percent of the colors they don't see reds and violets and greens they get blues and yellows and, that, and that's about it um, and you would expect that the monkeys that can see more colors are just better off we, we assume more colors equals better but there's trade-offs here, right? The monkeys that can see more colors are better at picking out fruit and uh, young leaves or in distance. But the monkeys that can see fewer colors are better at um, breaking the camouflage of insects that look like leaves and, and twigs. So each of these, um, each of these different kinds of umbelt um, have their own advantages. And indeed, animal umbelt are very much tailored to their own evolutionary needs. It's not that you know, more is necessarily better. Um, and the book is about embracing that, that difference and, and trying to learn from it. 
And you, you touched upon something there, which I think is, is uh, compelling with the book as well, is that you don't, you know, you move from, you start off by talking about dogs, which I think is a, a, a great start off because people have a, this connection to dogs, but then you move into lots of other different animals. Um, you, you literally span the, the animal kingdom. Um, and it's, it's interesting to, from a, so I study leeches, right, which are mm -hmm. esoteric to most people and, and really difficult for people to, to uh, understand maybe how, how you're interested in, in something that small or that um, to some people meaningless. Of course, they're not. We know that they're, they're very, very meaningful. But you span the gamut of, of animals in this book. And I was wondering what, what you found sort of most inspiring, maybe most surprising as you go through the different senses. And that's mainly how the book is, is um, layered, right? Is that, that it, it goes through the senses almost uh, one by one. And then of course, some sort of extra human uh, senses as well. But what was the most surprising and, and, and inspiring um, to you? It's hard, you know, they, they, I feel yeah. like they're all my babies and it, it's difficult to to pick between them. Um, you know, I do love you, the point you made about, um, about uh, you know, trying to tell the stories of animals that to some people might seem uncharismatic. You know, I, I think leeches are very cool too. Um, and uh, I didn't just want this to be a book about, um, you know, dogs and cats and, and all the things that are most familiar to us. Um, so, you know, to, to give some examples of, um, uh, you know, of uh, amazing stuff in, uh, among invertebrates, um, you know, earlier, a couple of slides ago, we saw pictures of scallops. Um, scallops, uh, most people know as, you know, these pucks of flesh on their dinner plates, but scallops um, have dozens of eyes along the edges of their shell, sometimes hundreds. The eyes can be incredibly beautiful. The eyes are actually pretty good. Uh, this animal has a really weird kind of vision in that it's got it's got these very high performing eyes but it seems unlikely that the scallop has a sort of movie playing of the world in this in the in the way that like everyone watching this probably has you know i can see the scenery around me my my eyes and my brain collectively builds this visual representation of the world i don't think the scallop has that i think the eyes simply notice when interesting things are happening around it, which it can then explore through other senses. It's an animal that likely sees without scenes, which is a, a very difficult thing, I think, for us to appreciate. Um, you know, you could, you could extend that to a lot of the other creatures. And even in the vision chapter alone, I, I write about jumping spiders, um, which have very good vision for a very small creature. A jumping spider um, might be a few millimeters across, but could probably um, see the moon in a brightly lit sky. Um, but like, if you look at a picture of a jumping spider, it'll have um, two sets, uh, two pairs of forward facing eyes. And the middle two are um, the sharpest. They do the acute vision and they also probably do color. But the ones on the side are a little smaller. Those seem to be responsible for detecting movement. And these are two things like acuity, sharp vision and movement detection that we just have in one eye. So it's really hard to think of them being separated but they are in a jumping spider. If you block out these, these lateral eyes, if you just cover them, the spider can't detect, a can't follow a moving object. It's, it's as if um, you know, the central eyes now become completely insensitive to movement. And that's, again, very, very difficult to imagine. You know, it's this division of labor between um, different sets of eyes is very, very, <laughs> that's a great image. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult for us to appreciate. You know, I write about um, killer flies that can that have incredibly fast vision. You know, the fly um, uh, takes off off and catches other insects on the wing, and its vision is so fast that you know it can spot an insect, take off, capture it, and land again. Probably before you know, visual signals even leave our retinas. But to an animal with vision that fast, our movements are going to be positively glacial. You know, a, a human walking up to it would essentially look as if it, we, we were standing still. Um, so there are lots of examples like that throughout the book. And, and I do think, I feel like I've always had a, a huge fondness for a lot of the creatures that other people uh, really hate. You know, I, I love um, snakes and bats and spiders and scorpions and all, all the rest. And there's a lot of them in the book, partly because they have um, incredible senses, incredible sensory adaptations. Uh, and because I think that, you know, they, they, um, 
they are fascinating in their own right. And, you know, I, I hope that I can make a case for why these creatures are, are just as worth knowing about as, you know, those yeah. that in our lives. And that was something, you know, again, I, I thought that that was really, really interesting in reading the book that, that you go from um, the, the more charismatic or traditionally charismatic animals to, to um, you know, lots of smaller animals that most people don't know anything about. You, you, you mentioned a couple of them already, but you talk about the brittle star and the way that um, especially one species of brittle star, which is in my realm, right, as an invertebrate mm -hmm. zoologist, um, how they turn off their, their uh, vision, basically, or, or change their vision at night. And yeah. they can they can tell that there's light coming at them, but they don't know from where or or what strength or anything. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just really really interesting to to hear about these adaptations and and you know stuff that that zoologists don't know about um, in this book that that you really you know it's a it really is a travelogue of of uh, animals and and senses and sensory structures and you dive very, very deep into some of them, I think, and come at it from a philosophical point of view, just like you said. Uh, and it's it really is a, a fantastical read. I'm a bit conscious of, of the time here. I know we we uh, need to have time for a couple of questions, I, I think. But um, um, again, I mean, I, I'm, I just I'm I'm in awe of this book because it is anchored in science, but uses a language that that makes you that is fantastical and wondrous and and you don't want to put the book down. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's it's uh, a, a really, really thorough piece of work, I think. And I, I was wondering how long it actually took to write this book because these things are uh, must take long. Yeah, um, I started, um, I think the idea for the book coalesced in early 2019. I started like putting together my wish list of like all the animals that I wanted to feature, the people I wanted to talk to, um, I just did reporting throughout much of 2019, you know, I went to different field sites, I met people who work with spiders and manatees and mantis shrimps and, and all the rest, and, um, and then I properly started writing the book in earnest in October of 2019, and um, my plan was it was going to take a, a 10 months to finish, and then pretty much exactly halfway through that, um, the pandemic began and I, I put down the book for um, for some time to cover COVID for the Atlantic. Um, I came back to it at the start of 2021 to finish it and, and here we are. Um, so it's it's been, um, you know, it's been a part of my life for um, three years now, um, but but three, you know, three and a half, but um, three, three and a half very, were very wonderful years. You know, I think that, you um, uh, in 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 real life, um, my world is um, more constrained than it used to be. You know, I, I travel less, I move about less, yeah. um, and I think that thinking about the sensory worlds of other animals feels like, as you say, a, a travelogue. You know, it's been described that by people like Van Oetschel and Marcel Proust and and many others. It, it feels like going on this grand adventure where. Yeah. I don't have to leave my desk, I don't have to move, you know, I can, I can just sit and think about these other worlds, or I can just, I, I can see the life around me that's very close to me um, in, in new and deeper ways. You know, I, I do this when I, when I walk my dog, Typo, um, I, I do this when we sit on the back, of, back deck of our home and, you know, look at um, sparrows perched on the nearby rooftops, you know, watch like doves and, and hawks flying overhead. I, I look at the, um, you know, just as a jumping spider in and, and the garden the other day, um, you know, small, see small insects flying about. Uh, all, all of these things um, might be in the exact same physical space as me, but are experiencing the world in radically different ways. And, and it feels like, um, like a, a salve to my weary soul to to um, think about their lives and and appreciate the world around me um, in, in new ways. I think it shows me that wilderness is is not a uh, something that I need to travel to like the Grand Canyon to experience. It is something yeah. that exists in my own backyard. Uh, and 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 that's amazing. Uh, that's a, it's a, uh, I think a a really good way to think about the uh, to to garner an appreciation for the world around you is to. To, to be open in your senses and your minds to no pun intended to um 
to the, the way that other animals experience their world. So I think we'll see a surge in, in Googles for jumping spiders from Toronto right now. I think if anyone uh, is wondering what a, what a jumping spider look, looks like, I think you should go into your backyard and see if you can see any very, very small spiders that um, are erratic in their movements and that will turn their eyes backwards to look at you. Um, yeah. The, the jumping spiders are everywhere in our backyard. So, so what Ed is talking about now is actually uh, surrounding us as we speak. Um, it's funny hey. that um, originally um, the uh, so the the basic structure of the book was was largely unchanged from the first draft. But one note that my editor had, which I think was very smart, was um, the uh, it used to be that the vision chapter was first, and she suggested moving smell up to the top. Yeah. And there's, a, there's actually a very good scientific reason for that, which was like when you when you when people read the book at the end of the smell chapter, you, you'll see what I mean. But um, but I think the, the the other consequence of this is that the first animal that people encounters is is the dog rather yeah. than jumping spiders. That's and I right. Think that's that's a good thing. You know, yeah. like lure, people like lured in with the dog yeah. first and that's then right. we're going to hit them with the spiders later when they're a bit more familiar and at ease. That's right. That's right. And I think I think you do that really well. And that's something that I appreciated, too, even if I work on animals that are that are a bit um, less understood by by. Um, by people, I think. Hey, uh, can I can I ask you a couple of questions here from the chat? Um, sure, that'd please. be okay. Please, please. Um, Aira McCall has a really good question. She says, uh, humans have developed aids for individuals who have limited senses, for example, eyeglasses and hearing aids. Uh, are there examples of other species using tools for support? Oh, ooh, that is a really good question. I agree. Are there examples of other species using tools in ways that? Mm. Well, okay. I, yeah. So, probably the best example of this, um, and it, it doesn't have the same kind of like disability connotations, right? But, like, think about what a spider's web is. Right? A spider's web is an extension of its own senses. It allows the, it allows the spider to. Um, collect vibrational information over a much greater area than the extent of its own body. Like a spider's body is, or is actually like very, very finely tuned to the world around it in itself. It, it's great at sensing vibrations. It's got these extremely sensitive hairs on it. But the web just, just transforms um, what the animal is capable of, of sensing. Um, you know, the, the kinds of information it can get, the area over which it senses. Um, and in, in the chapter about spiders, you know, I, I write about how first moment I don't have it, but it's it's like a, it's like a smartphone, right? It, it's it's similar. A smartphone to, is is my way of extending the the um, the range over which I'm gathering information, um, and it's a lot of it is very vibrational, right? and it's feeding me that information in in a, in a new way. And that's sort of what the spider's web is. It, it is a way of in, in, in like extending the reach and capacity of the animal's own senses. And, you know, the, in, in some like kind of quite remarkable ways, the spider tunes its web in a way, in a way that really resembles its tuning its own senses, you know, in, in a way that reminds me of like a person squinting to sort of focus on in the distance. A spider can do that. It can, it can tune the properties of the web so that different kinds of vibrations from different sizes of prey, for example, are more likely to reach it. Um, and yeah, so that, that would be my, that would probably be the first thing I would think about. Yeah, I think Great that's question, a question though. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I thought so too. And I, I started thinking about, um, you know, my own research and if there was any way that, that, um, annelids or, or, um, earthworms and leeches and, and, um, bristle worms, how they use any tools for senses. And I think it's just the medium that they're in, um, heightens their senses, you know, the, the, the seawater or the, the fresh water or some of them are terrestrial as well. And that that has allowed them to evolve the senses um, that they have. And so it's not so much a tool as it is a, the medium that they're in, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's another question here from Dick Winters who, who asks, um, do you think that we'll ever have conversations in quotation marks with other animals? And to some extent, we already, we already are having uh, conversations with other animals, but uh, which are most likely if so? Uh, would it be well, elephants, dolphins, chimpanzees? So, you know, people do 
find ways of communicating with other animals, right? Like I communicate to my dog with my dog. Um, you know, he understands commands that I give him. I I have learned to get better at like reading his signals and try to like understand his mental state. Yeah. Um, you know, do will we will we get there in a kind of Doctor Doolittle way? Um, I I actually. I mean, I doubt it. I, I think that you know we can we can do what we're sort of currently doing, but um, but but I think sometimes people think of this as a problem of almost like human language, right? Like we're, what we're what we're doing is really substituting is substituting vocabulary between one language and another. Um, but with other animals, it, it's the the problem is um, is substantially more difficult. Um, I, I write in in one of the later chapters that um, you know it's it's not just about what the animals the differences in the animal senses the different ways in which it perceives the world but it's also about like how the animal knits those senses together um, how it you know how it um, it's about the animal's brain it's about its nervous system the, the structure of the animal's body the the entirety of the creature is involved in processing the information from the sense organs so you know the, a lot of these like science fiction tropes of like and fantasy tropes of like you project your consciousness into the body of another animal yeah. just doesn't it, it just wouldn't work because yeah. it, the human consciousness is evolved within the context of the human body and the human nervous system it, it wouldn't work if it was in the body of the nervous system of an octopus for example um so yeah i think we sometimes underestimate just what a substantial challenge this is we're dealing with creatures with very different um you know not only senses but like styles of cognition very different bodies all all of these things really matter yeah absolutely and i think you know they they matter for animals um because it determines everything in their in their lives i mean this book talks about um talks about sex it talks about predation it talks about um understanding your surroundings to get to, to sort of get the most fitness perhaps which is the which is really what what this is all about for most animals is mm -hmm. is being able to survive being able to eat and being able to reproduce um and and the senses sort of come together in each individual to maximize that and it's different as you say the diff the, the setting is different for different animals and so they need to be maximized in different ways